Thank you. It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. I met with some amazing nurses and staff when I toured the Brampton Civic Hospital on the weekend. I got to see some of the amazing work they do as I toured the hospital. But as I walked the halls, something stood out to me, and it was no fault of the incredible staff at the hospital. I was shocked when I counted 33 beds in the hallways of the hospital. Wow. Mr. Speaker, I don't recall anything in the government's radio ads, self-congratulatory vanity ads, about keeping patients in the hallway. Mr. Speaker, how can this government let the most vulnerable and sick wait on stretchers in the hallway of our hospitals? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And um, you know, I just want to uh, remind the leader of the opposition that. He actually voted against a budget that added $1 billion to health care, uh, include Thank you. Carry on, please. He voted against a budget that added $1 billion to health care spending, including a $385 million. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. The member from Durham, come to order. You can sit and try to hide somewhere else. I'm still going to get you. Finish, please. Speaker, not only did they vote against a billion more dollars going into health care, they ran on a platform to fire 100,000 people, many of whom would be people working in health care. Yes, sir. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, no one is buying the government spin that they're not cutting health care. Right. Visit any hospital in Ontario and you see nurses fired. You see doctors irate with the government. You can't find a health care worker in the province of Ontario that supports this government. Now, let me share with you some stats. The Brampton Civic Hospital sees over 140,000 ER visits per year, but was built for a capacity of 90,000 ER visits per year. Beds in hospital hallways should never be the norm in Ontario, but it's the norm under this Liberal government. The patients of Brampton and Peel Region deserve more from their government. Mr. Speaker, will this government commit that the Brampton Civic Hospital will have the Question. resources they need not to be permanently over 100% capacity. Whether the Leader of the Opposition mentioned when he was at Brampton Civic Hospital whether he voted that he voted against the $8.2 million in new funding to that hospital this year. Did you talk about why you voted against a billion dollar increase? What, did he mention why he voted against a billion dollars addition to health care speaker? Uh, we're inches away from warnings. We're going to start right away. So let's not get there, please. Finish. There has been a 97 per cent increase in funding to that hospital. That's almost double since we were elected in 2003, Speaker. We have come a long way. There's still work to do, but I don't think this member can teach us Keep any smirking. lessons Answer. about how to spend health care dollars. Thank you. Keep Final supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, sometimes I, I can't believe this government can keep a straight face while saying that they're actually putting money to health care because they're not. Visit any hospital in Ontario, talk to any nurse, talk to any physician, and they all say the same thing. This is a government that's cutting, 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 and hurting patients in the province of Ontario. Now, let's speak about some more facts about the government's cuts to health care in Brampton. You know, because of this government's cut to physicians, there was a multi-specialty clinic in Brampton that just laid off five staff, affecting 2,000 patients. There was two family doctors who just announced in Brampton that they have to cut 14 hours of their clinic because of this government's cuts. That affected another 2,000 patients. 
So, Mr. Speaker, how many more patients in Brampton are going to have to suffer because of this government's Question. heartless cuts to health care? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, when we took office in 2003, we had the worst wait times in the country. We now have the shortest wait times in the country. Our investments in health care are paying off for patients, Speaker. We have 94 per cent of people now with a family doctor. We have 26,000 more nurses working in Ontario than we did when you were in charge of the system. You compared nurses to rural people. And you know, let's just remind ourselves we're approaching this two year anniversary. The member from Lambton, the come to order. In Barrie, that the Conservative Party would cut 100,000 workers in the And who was there? Answer. Position, none other than the federal MP at the time. The MP stood by Stephen Harper. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, since I can't get an answer on the health cuts and the cuts to patients, let's talk about something else. I want to ask the acting premier about the autism cuts. I want to share with the story a four-year-old Mason who lives in Burlington. He has been waiting for IBI therapy and has a moderate to severe autism. He, has, he is nonverbal and has trouble socially. He only eats five foods and none of them have much nutritional value. His family recently received a letter saying he will no longer qualify for IBI from the same group who just weeks ago said he desperately needs that very same treatment. This is what the mum had to say. We already spend thousands of dollars a year on social programs and camps. She said they will have to sell their home in Burlington to provide a fraction of the treatment that Mason question. needs for IBI. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is how can this government do this? How can this government abandon Mason? say, Speaker, that it is kids like Mason that have driven us to make important changes to our autism program. We are adding 16,000 spaces, so 16,000 kids like Mason will have access to the care they need more quickly. We will cut wait times in half. We are making a historic investment in new funding so more kids like Mason can get what they need when they need it. Speaker, we acknowledge that we're in a transition period. We know that is difficult for families, and that's why we urge families to Order. talk to their service providers about what this means for their individual kids. But, Speaker, 16,000 more kids getting the, the treatment they yes, need sir. for autism is, I think, something that should be applauded by all in this House. Be ashamed of yourself. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier, I'm not sure what alternate universe this government yeah. lives in, but to say they're doing it for Mason when they kicked him off the IBI wait list is, is unbelievable. Order. Let me give you another example, Mr. Speaker. Let me share with you the story of Lila. Her family lives in Etobicoke. Lila was getting close to the top of the list for IBI treatment. Her parents have been dreaming about what this will mean for Lila and how it will change Lila's life. Now they feel like they have waited for nothing as she was just kicked off the wait list. Her family struggles Order. to understand how this Liberal government can turn their backs on children. Mr. Speaker, Lila and her family were promised IBI treatment. She deserves IBI treatment. Mr. Speaker, why is this government kicking Lila off the treatment? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, we think Lila should not be on the waiting list. She should be getting service, Speaker. Kids like Lila staying on that wait list. She should have. I'll take care of that part. Deputy Premier. Finish. 
Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. Since you aren't listening about Lila's story and you kicked her off the wait list for IVI treatment, let me share another story. Let the five-year-old story of Daniel from Richmond Hill. He has severe autism. He can't speak. He can't feed himself. He can't dress himself. Just months ago, after three years of waiting on the IVI waitlist with Kinark, his family received a letter saying Daniel would soon be getting IVI treatment. In fact, he was on the top of the waitlist. The paperwork was about to be completed for this summer. And then Daniel was informed that because he's over five, this government took him off took him off the treatment he desperately needed. Mr. Speaker, Daniel's family can't get an answer from this government despite their pleading for an answer. They asked me to pose a question to the government, so I will ask the family's question of this government. Dan Daniel's family wants to know, what are we supposed to do now? What will happen to our son who can't even get his basic needs Thank you. met? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe that the status quo when it comes to services for kids with autism is unacceptable. It is not okay that kids spend years on the waiting list. We are investing an additional $333 million so that 16,000 more kids can get the treatment that they so need. We will not sit back as the opposition party wants to defend the status quo. They like the old system. We're moving ahead because we don't think it's okay that kids like Daniel, like Lila, like Mason sit on the wait list. They need to be as good as they can possibly be, and that means they need treatment and they need it earlier. That's Stop the clock. Um, it's much better when you, appro you address the chair. And the second thing is, is I don't want conversations going on while the member is trying to answer. So the member from Leeds Grenville will come to order, and the member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. You have a wrap-up sentence. You have a wrap-up sentence. Kids, we're doing this for the uh, speaker. We're doing this for the 16,000 more kids. That's why we're spending 333 million dollars more Thank you. on services. For Member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Dr. Ian Daw, who chaired the government's expert panel on autism, said, and I quote, what the government has funded was not what we recommended. Can the Deputy Premier explain to parents why the Liberal government bothered with an expert panel when it is clear they aren't interested in listening to the experts? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, let me quote uh, from uh, Margaret Spoutstra, who is the Executive Director of Autism Ontario. She said, families raising children with autism have been waiting for a long time for this announcement, providing early evidence-based intervention when it matters most will set children with autism on the best path forward. This investment will set the stage for continuous learning for years to come. Autism Speaks Canada says, we applaud the Ontario government for consulting with an expert committee as well as other stakeholders and families for, the from Hamilton Mountain, and second for basing time. this action plan on research and evidence-informed decisions. Speaker, and Dr. Peter Satsumari, the chief of the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaboration between CAMH, Sick Kids, and U of T, thank you. says, thank you. Supplementary. Not just the head of the government's own expert panel, the provincial advocate for children and youth called the government's plan, quote, a mugs game and said, quote, don't pretend this is about the child and what they need. It isn't. Wow. The advocate said children have told him, quote, we don't want you fighting over us. We just want you to provide us with what we need. What these children need, Speaker, is the IBI therapy that could change their lives. Will this government give the children what they're asking for? Thank you. You 
Be seated, please. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Youth Services. Mr. Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to share with the House in response to the question about Dr. Daw, who issued a statement yesterday because he was concerned that certain remarks are taken out of oh, context. context. And what Dr. Daw said yesterday, he issued a statement saying he stands firmly behind the recommendations made in the report by the Ontario Clinical Expert Committee on Autism, oh, which lays oh, out lays out a comprehensive strategy for what a s autism system should look like. So that is what Dr. Daw is saying. The member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. Committee, we have based this program based on advice from that committee, along with uh, other work that's been underway for some time. Answer. And, uh, that report's available online, Speaker. And I've met with the youth advocate on autism. Please to respond in supplementary. Please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal government is cutting children off the autism therapy that they need, and the experts say will help. The experts say the government decision is wrong. The provincial advocate for children and youth said it's wrong. Parents say it's wrong. Educators say it's wrong. There isn't a single child with autism who will be better off if the government cuts them off IBI therapy when they turn five. Will the Deputy Premier admit that autism does not end at five and give these children the therapies that they so desperately need? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to acknowledge the, the families who are here and the, the action groups are who are here. Chair, please. I appreciate sorry, Speaker. I appreciate them being here. I've met with a number of them. And may I say to Speaker that in the recent meetings, they have been extremely helpful in their advice. They've been extremely concrete in how we develop this new program going forward. They know there's an implementation committee being struck, a number of them asked to be on it. That is being considered currently. And uh, it's very important that I hear those stories directly from families. It's informing my thinking. It is informing the, uh, the program going forward. And, Speaker, the current system is unacceptable. I think That's we can right. all agree on that. Speaker, we want to make sure every child who has autism Answer. gets the services when they need it for the right duration, and that's my commitment to these families here today and all families and children Thank you. facing autism. That's the part of it that I Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also for the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Deputy Premier about hospitals that are overcrowded and why this Liberal government has no policies or standards for hospital occupancy. But yesterday, the Deputy Premier, the former Health Minister, denied it was a problem and insisted it's just a, quote, system in transition. Then she insisted it was irresponsible to build hospital uh, capacity, and then she said we are building new hospitals. Yeah. Will the Deputy Premier actually get her story straight, Speaker? Cut the spin and admit that Liberals have cut uh, Liberal cuts rather have left Ontario hospitals in a dangerously overcrowded situation. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker. Um we are investing $12 billion over the next 10 years to expand and rebuild hospitals. 35 major hospital projects are underway or are being planned. So our commitment is to continue to rebuild and build new hospital infrastructure. At the same time, Speaker, we do recognize that many people in hospital would be better served outside of the hospital. And that's why we're expanding our commitment to community-based care. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, second care, time. Long-term care. The hospitals are a vital part of our health care system, but when somebody is ready to leave the hospital and receive their care outside the hospital, we need to work to make sure that, that care outside the hospital is available, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, according to the OECD, the safe level of occupancy for countries like the UK is 85 per cent, but hospitals across Ontario are operating at nearly 120 per cent capacity for months on end. Dr. Samir Sinha, who led Ontario's senior strategy, has said that when hospitals operate at or above 100 per cent capacity, quote, everyone agrees that's not a safe level to run. End quote. But hospitals across the north, in Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay and Blind River, have been over 100 per cent for months on end. The Sioux Area Hospital speaker has been above 100 per cent capacity for two whole years. Will the Deputy Premier stop the cuts to Ontario's hospitals? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, if the, if the leader of the third, third party actually had read Dr. Samir Sinha's report, Living Longer, Living Well, she would know that his advice to us was to do exactly what we're doing, which is to build capacity outside hospitals. The solution is not to build more hospital beds in every community in the province. The solution is to provide the support that is right for patients. It's a patient-centered approach that we're taking. We're getting people the care they need, whether it's in hospital or whether it's at home or in the community or an alternate setting. Speaker, to focus simply on hospitals and to say the solution to overcrowding in hospitals is build more hospital beds does not reflect the root problems within the health care system. Answer, thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, you can't cherry-pick the advice. If hospitals shouldn't be operating over 100 per cent, they shouldn't be operating over 100 per cent, period. End of story. And speaker, it is not just hospitals in the north. Our hospitals in Toronto, Ottawa, Scarborough and Hamilton all are, are all overcrowded. Hospitals in mid-sized communities like Belleville, Brantford, Burlington, Dunville, and Peterborough, more often than not, don't have any available beds. Order. This is not a system in transi transition, Speaker. This is a system in total crisis, and this Liberal government put it there. So my question once again, Speaker, is will this Liberal government stop cutting our hospitals? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Speaker, I, I hate to do this, but I feel I have to remind the leader of the third party what she and her party voted against in the last budget. They voted against a $1 billion increase in health care spending that included $345 million increase for hospitals. They voted against. Deputy Premier. They voted against an additional $270 million for home care. And Finish, please. They voted against $75 million more for hospice care, for palliative care in the community. They voted against $85 Answer. million dollars for community health centres, Speaker. We are moving forward. We are increasing funding to the health care system because Thank patients you. deserve that, Speaker. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvin. Thank you. My question is to the Deputy Premier. During today's Oppo Day debate, we will be calling on your government to restore funding for IBI therapy for children over the age of five. Thousands of Ontario families, Autism Ontario, the Provincial Advocate for from Beaches, Beaches, East York, the Ontario Association for Behavioural Analysis, the Chair of your own expert committee, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, the Ontario Federation of Labour, the Ontario Public School Boards Association, CUPE, OPSU, and now municipalities are all opposing your decision. Minister, how many more experts do have to come forward before you understand removing IBI therapy for kids over five will impact children's ability to communicate with their family, succeed in school, and thrive in Question. our community? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. 
Speaker, it is beyond me why anyone in this legislature would defend the status quo when it comes to services for kids with autism. Speaker, we are adding 16,000 spaces. We're increasing funding by uh, $333 million, an historic investment in improving services for kids with autism, getting them off the wait list and into service. So let's hear what Dr. Peter Setsmari, a renowned, world-renowned expert in autism, said. He said it is so important to personalize intervention services for kids with children with ASD. This funding opportunity is a significant step in that direction. Early intervention for all, but different interventions at different times is an essential step in the right direction. Speaker Suzanne Jacobson, founder of Quick Start Early Intervention for Answer. All, said parents spoke and they were heard. The right service at the right time, individualized, expanded, and timely services will be life-changing. We applaud. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Wellington Health and Hills. Question is also to the Deputy Premier. Last Friday, I met in Georgetown with families from our riding who have children with autism spectrum disorder. Linda and David Galveo's sons, Toby and Luke, both have ASD. David and Linda are planning to be here later on today. Their older son, Toby, began IBI therapy at age six, and within 30 days, he went from being nonverbal to speaking and even reciting the alphabet. Their younger son, Luke, has been on the IBI wait list for three years, and he's now six. Under the government's plan to ration IBI therapy, Luke would be denied the chance to reach his full potential, the same chance that IBI therapy at age six gave to his older, son, his older brother, Toby. How can this government be so heartless as to say to the Galveo family that their older son has a future, but their younger son is on his own? Thank you. Um, speaker, let me read one more quote, and then I know that the minister will want to speak. Uh, Dr. Wendy Roberts, the vice chair of the ASD Clinical Expert Committee, and again, a world-renowned expert, says, this announcement is very good news for the ASD community. Based on scientific evidence, the new plan strongly supports the continuum of care for all kids with ASD, expanding intervention services to earlier in a child's development, which is critical for improved outcomes. I am proud and excited to support the new program based on the advice of the expert panel. And that's Dr. Wendy Roberts, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. For the third time, hundreds of parents of children with autism are once again coming to Queen's Park. They're here to tell you, the government, to stop taking away life-changing therapy from children that they have been waiting for years. Parents Member just want Sudbury. their children to be able to tell them what's wrong when they're in pain. Parents are saying it's pay now or pay later. Yes, IBI may be expensive, but not being proactive will cost this government much, much more. Will the minister acknowledge that her plan will fail a generation of kids on the spectrum? Thank you. Speaker, um, we agree with parents and we agree with advocates that autism does not end at age five. There is no age cutoff, Speaker, for services in this new program. In fact, in the new program, Speaker, all children with a diagnosis, including those over five, will receive better services, they'll receive them sooner, that are customized to meet individual needs, including those who require intensive therapies and interventions. Speaker, there's 40,000 uh, children with autism in this province. I recognize that there's a, a, a subset of that, approximately 2,000. 200 families across the province that will feel some changes during this transition period. And that is exactly Answer. why we're paying close attention to those indigi individual families to make sure that they get the information they need, to make sure they get the support they, they need, you. and the children have the, reached their full. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the experts were clear that for IBI to be effective, it needs to be for a minimum of a year. But $8,000 will cover less than two months of IBI. Okay. Parents will now get to see the potential of their will now get to see the potential of their children be ripped away from them. That's cruel and it's unfair. 
This government is actually silencing the voices of children by not giving them the therapy that they need to communicate. Yesterday, the city of Pickering, in the minister's own writing, passed a resolution calling on her to reinstate funding for IBI regardless of the age. The minister's own writing, her own hometown, the people who elected her and sent her here are calling on her to do the right thing and to make sure that they reinstate the kids Question. for IBI. Will the minister admit that she's hurting families and reverse her decision to place an age cap on IBI Thank therapy? You. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. So, Speaker, um, resolutions from municipalities come from councillors, not from residents. I think that's important to note. Secondly, secondly, the member opposite. I would like to quote the member opposite. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I think it's important to know that the member asking the question said la late last year, study after study has shown that treatments are generally more effective when they're delivered to children before the age of seven. That was she a quote that. from the member late last year. But the bigger point, Speaker, is that all autistic children deserve to get the right services at the yes, right sir. intensity at the right time and that is my commitment it's an historic investment speaker of 333 million dollars and 60 thank you new question the member from the public center Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Uh, Speaker, I know that our government is committed to ensuring access to justice for all Ontarians. In fact, the minister herself, I know, is very committed to bringing together various partners within the legal community to identify barriers and work together to address them. Reforms to our justice system that ensure simple, fast, and affordable access to the justice sector services is one of the ways our government is uh, committed to improving the system. I was happy to learn of the Attorney General's Justice Roundtable, which engages with vital partners in the justice sector. Minister, could you please speak to this House on the work you are doing at the Justice Roundtable? Thank you, Attorney General. I'd like to thank the member for Etobicoke Centre for his question. We are committed to making the justice system simpler, faster, and more accessible for all Ontarians. Our Justice Roundtable brings together key justice and community partners to discuss the issue they face and how we can work in new and different ways to resolve them together. The Justice Roundtable serves as a very important forum to promote communication and collaboration among the ministry and justice system stakeholders. I had the pleasure of hosting our latest roundtable last week, and I look forward to discussing the detail in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. I'm very pleased to hear that the Attorney General is, uh, is talking to our partners in the justice system. I'm also very proud to hear that the Ministry of the Attorney General has uh, created new um, avenues for family law and criminal law by favoring communication and collaboration in that sector our system takes advantage of the knowledge of experts and i'd like the attorney general to tell us more about what the experts are saying thank you mr speaker i would also like to thank again the miss the member for etobicoke center this roundtable focuses on two main topics. The Ministry has identified key aspects of, in family law and criminal law and has also gotten different advice on ex from experts. We want family law to be more uh, efficient and accessible and our roundtable on criminal law aims at bringing more people into the system. We want to be leaders in this system by bringing change that will improve 
access to the legal system across Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Speaker, uh, Aidan Timmons is a five-year-old boy with autism in my riding. Aidan's nonverbal, and he was on the IBI waiting list for 17 months. His dad, Sean, tells me his dream is to hear Aidan say, I love you, Dad. One morning last month, Sean found his wife, Sonia, in tears. In her hand was a letter stating that because Aidan had just turned five, he was suddenly no longer eligible for IBI. The day Sean and Sonia learned that the light at the end of our tunnel was snuffed out was April 2nd, World Autism Day. Shame. That's shameful, Speaker, so my question is simple. Will the minister do the right thing and give Aidan the therapy he needs question. to find his voice? Thank you. <clears throat> you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier, uh, sorry, uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. As both the Premier and I have said in this House on a number of occasions, our government is committed to improving the lives of children with autism and the lives of their families. And that is exactly why we are addressing this very unsustainable situation we find ourselves in. That is exactly why we don't want children to be stranded on wait lists. Children who have been on the IBA wait list are going into immediate service speaker, and they will be supported Order, please. Uh, during that time get, uh, to the $8,000 uh, uh, payment for services as well as uh, post that. All children who have autism, no matter where they are in the spectrum, deserve the right kind of intensity, the right kind of support. That is what the new autism is, program is all about. We are yes, getting sir. down to the family levels so to make sure they are all well supported by their service provider. And if that's not happening, Thank you. I want to hear more from families about that. Supplementary, member Thanks. from Niagara West, Palambra. Thanks, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, I've known you for a long time. And I, I don't believe this is you. I don't believe that you would countenance policy that would pit kids under five and the parents Order. against kids who are older than five and the parents. And I think you know in, in your heart, too, that the parents don't like that. They don't like the notion of having to crawl over some other parents and their kid to get service. Remember next to you, Mississauga Streetsville, he has a constituent in his riding named Adam. And Adam is one of those kids and his mom. Initially, Adam's treatment was supposed to be in August of 2017. It would be after he turned five. They looked into the wait list to find out with your new policy. The answer received, August of 2017. It had not changed. He would be cut off. Minister, I know in your heart the policy you believe Chair, should please. be judging by the need of the child, not the age of the calendar. Can you make sure Adam gets a service Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Before I go to the minister, just a reminder, please, through the chair. It's, uh, it's designed that way. Minister. So, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from the opposition for what I believe are very you know, sincere words towards me. But, Speaker, I need to be very clear. I am committed to making positive change for children with autism. I am committed to making sure that this investment of 333 uh, million dollars happens notwithstanding that the opposition the member from Leeds party Grenville, voted second against time. notwithstanding the third party voted against this investment and speaker we're going to keep going because these children deserve to get the support they need whether they're currently in therapy whether they are are on a wait, a wait list and will be now taken off that wait list and into immediate service i am committed to this program speaker my government's committed to this i'm committed Answer. to the families here and all families in Ontario to make it better for these children with autism. They have my unwavering Thank you. commitment. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Can the Deputy Premier tell Ontarians how many experts they consulted be before uh, democratic reform and how many public meetings were held before introducing today's reform legislation? Thank you. 
Deputy Premier. House Leader. House Leader. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I, I'm uh, very proud that this afternoon that we will be tabling a piece of legislation that will uh, that will introduce some very major reforms to the um, election uh, financing rules in the province of Ontario. Speaker, uh, these uh, this proposal is uh, very much inspired by what we are hearing uh, from uh, from the public uh, writ large, where they want uh, they want transparency. They want accountability, and as a result, Speaker, the proposal that will be tabled today will put a, b a ban on corporate and union donations. It will introduce uh, strict limitations on third-party uh, advertising. It's going to, uh, Speaker, ensure that there are uh, hard uh, caps on on limits uh, uh, for fund uh, fundraising and many other important features. I hope, expect, uh, uh, Speaker, and the Premier right, expect uh, that the opposition parties, especially the, the NDP, will participate in the process to make sure that Ontarians get, a, uh, get an you. opportunity to bring their point of views forward. Supplementary. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Acting Premier. After a decade of scandals, today's legislation does not address the cynicism or the trust issues that Ontarians have with this government. This bill limits nonpartisan groups from speaking out about issues like autism, climate change or fair pay, but it does give free reign for partisan government advertising that, in the words of the AG, allows self-congratulatory and self-promotional advertising that will be of little practical use to the citizens paying for it. Yeah, this bill is about helping the Liberal Party. Yep. Will the Deputy Premier commit to fixing the bill that they've introduced, or will the government be using its legislative majority to ensure that this bill helps the Ontario Liberal Party once again? Again. again. Speaker, I, I, I find it rich coming from the NDP who have done nothing but drag their feet on this process. Speaker, They have done nothing but to offer one for some members, it really doesn't matter where you sit. I can tell who you are. Carry on. Speaker, the NDP has, to, has failed to offer one substantive thought or idea on this very important issue. When we have asked them to come to meetings so we can, dis we can discuss the sus substantive aspect, they have boycotted. I want to give credit uh, to uh, the, uh, the official opposition for coming to the meeting and engaging in a healthy discussion. I want to give credit to the Green Party speaker who come to a meeting and give substantive ideas. NDP, nowhere to be seen, Speaker. So before NDP gets on their uh, 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 holy place, Speaker, they should engage in this process. Let's make sure that we get this matter to the uh, to the committee so Thank that you. we can hear from Ontarians across throughout the summer. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, uh, Northumberland, Quinty West. <coughs> Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, there has been a lot of mention in the news about rabies in the Hamilton area lately. My understanding is that these animals have been infected with a particular strain of rabies that hasn't been seen in Ontario since 2005. I know that Ontarians might have questions about how the reemergence of this disease happened and what steps Ontario has taken to mitigate it. Can the minister share how his ministry and its partners are working to control this outbreak and ensure public awareness of raccoon rabies? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forests. Speaker, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank the member from uh, Northumberland, uh, Quinny West, for the question. Speaker, uh, while we can't say for sure, Speaker, how we have ended up in this situation with an outbreak of rabies, in Ontario, uh, we expect probably that an animal came in on a vehicle or, or like a, a rail car or something. We know we've had a great record in the province for eight or ten years since we have had a situation where the ministry has had to deal with a rabies outbreak. That is owed in large part to a great program, a Made in Ontario solution that's been in place for a number of years, where the baits, some 220,000 now in the springtime or last year or last fall, to deal with this outbreak, a Made in Ontario solution where the baits are distributed around the border communities in the United States to try and prevent areas that don't have a program from those animals finding their way into Ontario and creating a problem for us. We've distributed, Speaker, about 220,000 baits last year. Answer. The animals basically go into hibernation. The baits are less effective over the winter months, so we stopped the program in the winter, but I've got more to add on that in the Thank supplementary. You. Thank you, Speaker. Well, thanks uh, to the minister for his answer. It's good to know that uh, his ministry is responding to 
this outbreak. I know the last time there was a, an outbreak of this nature that our tools were very limited, leading to the calling of many raccoons as a preventive measure. It is reassuring that we now have tools like this vaccine that can be more broadly and more humanly used to control the spread of this disease. Can the minister elaborate on his ministry plans to further address this problem? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you very much. And again, I want to thank the, uh, the member for the opportunity to elaborate. Speaker, as I mentioned in the opening response, this is a made in Ontario solution. 220,000 baits last year. We resumed the baiting again on April 1st. An additional 500,000 baits with more to come. By the time the program is completed, we will have distributed somewhere in the order of 1.1 uh, million baits around the province of Ontario, uh, hoping to be as effective as we can. Speaker, we're doing everything that we can. We want this question today to bring some some sort of public awareness around this campaign so that people, if they see animals, skunks, raccoons, foxes that are acting in an odd manner, to make sure they contact their animal services agencies and their municipalities and let them know. We believe that the program will take probably, Speaker, at least a couple of years before we can really see if we uh, have had an ability to be effective and eliminate the rabies problem in Ontario Answer. once more. But I want to thank the, the people on the ground. A made in Ontario solution that's been very effective over the last thank 10 years. The question, the member from Halliburton, Fort Lake, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Kristen from Coburg has a son, Carter, who has autism and is turning six in August. He's smart and capable of learning, but he's unable to feed himself with a spoon or a fork, unable to dress or bathe himself, and is unable to tell his mom if he's in pain or how he feels. Carter started IBI therapy in April, and the results were amazing. He mastered two new skills with just 20 hours of IBI, nice. but the therapy will only run for six months, not the years that he was promised. Carter is proof that IBI is critical, even for children five and older, but it needs to be consistent. Kristen is scared about what will happen without this treatment. I'm standing up for her because her own MPP cancelled her meetings three times, told her that he wouldn't read anything that she wanted to leave behind. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the government give families like Kristen and Carter hope for a better future and restore IVI therapy for children? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. It's an important one because her question is about children currently getting IBI therapy. It's important to clarify, Speaker, those children will continue to get IBI therapy. Yes, they will have a clinical assessment at uh, six months, and the course of action will be determined by that clinical assessment, Speaker. So if they need to continue with intensive uh, support, that's what they will get. And they are not being automatically removed from intensive therapy. That is a misconception out there. It's important that the opposition get the facts the opposition straight. Is and that, as that it speaks to the need to make sure that we're supporting Sorry. children wherever they are on the spectrum, uh, Speaker, that they get the support they need based on the clinical advice Answer. and that they're well supported going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, back to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Laura Martin of Conestoga has a seven-year-old son, Cole, who, after three years of waiting, finally started receiving IBI treatments in January. Laura has already begun seeing significant improvements in Cole's self-control and dealing with his aggressiveness, and now this Premier's pulling the rug out. Battling families of children with autism to prevent them the hope for treatment wow. they'd waited for so long, in the words of his mom, Ms. Martin, is ludicrous. Speaker, will the minister do the right thing for Laura Martin, Cole, and the families across Ontario? Will she restore families' hope and restore the IBI treatment that her government has ripped away from coal. Right, thank you. Right. Speaker, when I meet with families, it's stories like this that motivate me. They inspire me to hear about the progress that these children are making. And that is what we all want, Speaker. We want to see children with autism spectrum disorder make progress. And I welcome those stories. It, it, it motivates me, it inspires our government in terms of the work we do. It just reinforces our commitment, Speaker, to make sure all of these children, all 40,000, are well supported in this program, which will provide more service, more money, 
and more individual support to families. I, I welcome these stories from the families here today, from, from the opposition, Answer. and uh, I encourage the opposition to, to share those stories That's with me right. because it's very, very important that the voice of families and children continue to be heard. Thank you. New question, the member from London uh, West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. On Saturday, we learned that the London and District Distress Centre will close by the end of the year with its crisis response line transferred to the provincial agency Connex Ontario. That same day, NDP leader Andrea Horvath joined me and the member from London Fanshawe in London as we listened to patients and healthcare providers share horror stories about the failure of our healthcare system and the crisis in mental health. Speaker, telephone crisis support provides a key entry point into a mental health system that is already stretched to the limit. Too many Londoners in crisis have been turned away from ER or forced to wait days to access emergency mental health services. The new 24-7 mental health crisis centre is already at capacity. What will the Deputy Question. Premier do to ensure that the community mental health services Londoners need are in place after they call the crisis line? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for uh, London West for this very important question. And I know that she genuinely does care about uh, uh, having the right supports there for people who are struggling with mental health issues. I can assure you that this is a high priority for our government. We have invested substantially in mental health uh, uh, services, Speaker, including as she mentioned, the new 24-7 crisis centre that is a, a, a made-in-London innovation that I do hope will spread to uh, communities across the province. It was the result of everyone in the community coming together and designing a solution that fit the needs of London. Speaker. As she mentioned, it's at capacity. That tells us that we were on the right track when we funded it, but there's more to do, obviously. And having a place where people can call when they are in distress is an important part of the continuum of services. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, London's new 24-7 mental health crisis centre was full almost from the day it opened. About 70 per cent of those walking in the door are first-time users of mental health supports. 60 per cent of people are under the age of 35. Clearly, the demands for mental health services in London are increasing and will continue to grow. What concrete action will the Acting Premier take to expand access to community-based mental health services in London? Thank you, Speaker. And I, I, I do thank the, the, the other member from London for, uh, for this question. And again, I think we're all on the same page when we say we want the best possible services for people struggling. And that's why, Speaker, we've invested substantially in mental health. In Order, fact, please. We have, um, we have almost doubled the funding for mental health and addiction services since we were elected. We have developed comprehensive strategy that we are implementing. There is no question that people facing mental health challenges need and deserve to get the support they need in a timely way, and we're making important investments to achieve that goal. Thank you. Your question, the member from Ottawa, Orléans. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, the member of Ottawa Centre and I recently attended this, the start of the Heroes Are Human Capital to Capital ride in Ottawa. This 15-day bike ride event covers 1,538 kilometres from the capital of Canada to the capital of the United States. The minister was also there, and we had a wonderful time working to increase awareness about PTSD and other injuries faced by first responders. I know that this government passed Bill 163 in order to help address PTSD in first responders. Could the minister please provide the House with an update on the government's PTSD awareness initiatives? Thank you. Minister of Labour. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for that very important question, and also for the support of, uh, for her support and the support of all members of this House on Bill 163. Yeah. I've been hearing from first responders across the province. They're talking about reducing stigma. They're talking about the launch of the awareness campaign. Amazing. In March, we had the radio ads. We had the social media. Well done. I'm happy to tell the House today that our PTSD posters are now being distributed all over the province, and they're starting to work, Speaker. I heard they're going to fire firefighters, police officers, paramedics, those people in the field that can see this and can come forward and start talking about PTSD. We've shared them at the Paramedics Chiefs Conference, Partners in Prevention Conference, and I know that members from all parties in this House are sharing them with their own first responders. We did attend the Heroes of Human Capital to Capital ride, excellent event, Answer. bike ride from Ottawa to Washington. It's going to help raise awareness about post-traumatic stress disorder. Amazing. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for his answer. And as I mentioned, we met numerous first responders at the start of the bike ride who were excited that our government passed legislation to help first responders when they need our help the most. Mental health issues demand the attention of us all, and I'm happy that we're working to end the stigma, as the minister explained. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government has also launched a website to and other resources to assist with prevention and awareness of PTSD. Can the minister please provide this house with an update? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that supplementary question. Members of the, of the House will remember when we supported this, part of the PTSD strategy was a toolkit so that employers of first responders would have a guide as to how they could deal with prevention plans. That toolkit, Speaker, is available at www.firstrespondersfirst.ca. I'd urge people to go to the site. We continue to update the toolkits on a regular basis. The feedback has been incredibly positive. The other part we did, Speaker, was that we required employers of first responders to submit their prevention plans to me. I'm going to publish those plans publicly Good so that you. we can learn from each other. Speaker, the it's building amazing. blocks for an excellent strategy to combat PTSD are underway in the province of Ontario. We're going to be asking Answer. for the prevention plans to be in by April of 2017. Speaker, we promised Ontario would be a leader. We are a leader right. now in PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. The question, the member from Oxford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. The minister says that kids aren't getting kicked off IBI. But that's not the reality for the parents in my riding. Six-year-old Lawson should have had his IBI assessment six months after treatment started. Instead, the government announced their new policy. He had his assessment two and a half months early. Just two weeks later, his mother received a letter about him being transitioned off IBI. She has been fighting to keep him on ever since. Lawson's mother waited six years for her son to be able to call her mom. Now that Lawson is finally getting the treatment he needs, his mother's living with fear that he will lose it and anger at this government that they are taking it away. That is the real result of the minister's policy and the reality of the autistic kids. Will the minister reverse her policy and give kids like Lawson the services they need and are entitled to? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you I want to thank the member for the, the question. I think um, we should all agree, may I suggest, that we are not clinicians. We are, we are not the, the clinical judge of what is appropriate for a child's treatment. I leave that expertise to the, to the clinicians. And children who are in IBI will continue to get IBI, and, and then they'll have the clinical assessment and we, then it, it goes from there. What's really important to note, Speaker, is that all children with a diagnosis, including those five and over, will get better services sooner. They're customized to, to meet individual needs. And Speaker, I'm very open, as I have said, and the Premier has said, about how the new program looks in terms of the service delivery to the parents. I think they've uh, provided some excellent advice, Speaker. We're taking that uh, under consideration, the context of implementation and uh, we'll keep listening to Thank parents you. and advocates. Thank you. Question the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Children and Youth Services, Angelo is a nine-year-old who lives in Ajax Pickering. In a letter typed to his, by his mother, Angelo talked to the Premier about his six-year-old brother, Matteo, 
who waited four years to receive IBI therapy. Angelo spoke about his love for his brother and the fact that IBI therapy has made him really happy to go to school. Angelo said, Speaker, now he's in IBI, he's mastering a lot of stuff. He understands when I talk to him, he plays with me, he dresses himself, he answers to his name and looks at me. I want my brother to have a good life, to be happy like he is now, to talk more and not run away so we can go out more and be happy together. In his letter, he pleaded with the Premier Question. to change her mind on IBI funding. Speaker, will the minister cancel the cuts to funding for IBI therapy for those above five years old so that Matteo can continue on the road to become a better... Thank you. Minister. Again, I thank the opposition for the, the question, Speaker, and I think there was reference to an autistic child in school, and that's a very important part of the uh, program going forward, Speaker, because it is important that every child, every student has access to the support they need in school and at home, and that's why there's been $77 million invested in board, school board capacity to improve the learning environment for children with ASD. I want the same things, Speaker, as this mother wants. For, for their child. I want them to be successful. I want them to be happy. I want them to reach their full potential. And that's why we're making this historic investment. The, uh, the motion coming forward today from the House Speaker, with the support of the NDP, um, quite frankly, will take us backwards. Answer. It will keep kids on wait lists. It will keep kids out of treatment. I don't want that. Families don't want that. Advocates don't want that. Let's do the best we can for this investment going forward. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Child, Children and Youth Services. I'm concerned that the Liberal government appears to think they know better, better than the clinicians and experts when it comes to services for children with autism. Not only has the government misrepresented what was what was in the experts panel recommendation, the uh, the member will withdraw. I would draw, Mr. Speaker. Not only was, not only has the government misrepresented what was in the experts' panel. The member will withdraw. I'd withdraw. I'll withdraw. And if it happens again, you lose the question. They've now called on the former chair, telling the truth about government's failure, regrettably and unfortunate. What is regrettable and Question. unfortunate, Speaker, is that the government is stealing services from children with autism just to save money. Will the minister immediately rethink this plan and Thank ensure you. no child? Thank you. You it, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm not sure how spending $333 million more in addition to the $190 million a year we spend in this program is anything less than an investment. Speaker, I'm not the expert. I'm the Minister of Just by way of information, it's never too late to be named. Finish, please. Speaker, I'll continue to listen to the voices of parents, to listen to, listen to the voices of experts uh, who are very learned in this field, and to listen to the member from Leeds, Granville, that have given us some very concrete, some very helpful advice in recent weeks. Speaker, I am very appreciative of that. Their advice will guide our implementation work, Answer. and uh, we all want the same thing, Speaker, to help these children. Thank you. Uh, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo, on a point order. of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a question on the order paper number 658 regarding missing, person, less, missing persons legislation. It is passed due. Again? One moment, please. My information that it is uh, not overdue. The Minister of Agriculture. Oh, right. 
get some new staff over there. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. A point of order. I'd like to introduce the members' East Gallery, Mr. Lear Davis, who is a director of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture from Brant County. Welcome. Thank you. The Deputy House Leader, on point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Kathleen Powell of the St. Catharines Museum, Welland Canal Centre, who is with us today. Thank you. From, uh, Kitchener, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce constituents from my riding, Ken McLaughlin and Janet McLaughlin, here today uh, on the uh, Oppo Day motion. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.